Our next speaker, Director of Cloud Computing and Marketing and all things virtually at Intel, Regine Skillen, please a round of applause. Thank you so much. Um, my name is Regine. I uh, have run our cloud marketing organization at Intel for about five years now. Uh, when we started, we were working with just uh, the big cloud service providers, Google, Facebook, you've heard of them, right? We were working really quietly with them, developing new products and technologies that we thought would help transform and help them grow. Over time, we've extended that. We work directly with a number of cloud service providers all over the world now, um, in China, Asia, Europe. Um, as well as we're getting involved with a lot of enterprise companies building out cloud and a lot of the challenges that come together. Um, so I'm going to spend today talking about some of the trends I'm seeing based on either talking to the service providers directly or the end customer's enterprise and how that's looking from a public and private cloud adoption. So I'm, uh, Jonathan did a great job of talking about what the cloud is and what's driving that. I want to talk about the growth that is really fueling the need for the elasticity that Jonathan was talking about. We know that it's a connected world. There's about two and a half, three billion people connected to the internet. We're going to add another billion people to the internet by 2015. And instead of just accessing the internet with your phone, you're going to access the internet with your phone, your tablet, your car, your refrigerator, your coffee pot. Everything that can compute or have electricity going forward will probably have some kind of a smart intelligence in it, a sensor, something that it's enabling it to capture that data and transform and allow more insights into that data. But what we're seeing is that's driving massive growth in the data center. It's estimated that anywhere between 20 to 60 of these connected intelligent devices drives the need for a new server in the data center. So the question is, how are we going to handle that growth? How are we going to not only manage the scale needed and do it efficiently, but how are we going to get better use out of that data? And that's what I want to talk about today. But at first, um, I thought I'd play a little video to show you where this data is coming from. I did find it a little ironic that that video is called One Network Minute, and uh, it's actually two minutes long. I think, I, I think it could have been better in a minute. But I find it interesting also, 100,000 tweets per minute, 6 million page views, 20 million photo views on Flickr. That's a lot of data. It also makes me wonder what people are doing at work. if They're just checking Facebook and tweeting all the time. But um, it's a lot of data that we needed to manage that growth on. So what we're going to see is if you just look at that data traffic over the IP 
IP data traffic, we're going to see it grow about 3x over to, to, between now and 2015. And what do we need to do? So I'm going to talk about two things. First, I'm going to talk about the cloud, because that really is the infrastructure that enables us to handle and store and scale and respond with that data. And I'll talk a little bit about big data in the end. That's how we're going to use that data, the analytics and the insight we're going to gain from it. Jonathan did a nice job talking about the open cloud. I don't need to go through this in any more detail. But it really isn't just, OK, yeah, there is a lot of open washing and a lot of cloud washing. But remember, a couple years ago when we were talking about the cloud, we all felt the need to put quotes by it, you know, the cloud, right? Because it was a theory, it was a trend, and it was hype. Now it's really being deployed. We are seeing companies move from virtualization into true elasticity and automation and that scale. We're seeing some of the loudest cloud service providers obviously scale their infrastructure as well. Uh, when we look at the open cloud and what we want to see in terms of industry, it's a collaborative effort that we all need to move to together. We want to enable federation. This is that openness, that transparency that allows one cloud to connect to another that allows your private cloud to connect to a public cloud, that allows clouds to share data for public benefit or business benefit, right? That's standards, that's APIs, that's a common format, but that's also a common approach to security, because if we're gonna start federating clouds, we need to make sure those connections are secure. We also talk about automation. If the cloud is about driving this massive elasticity and efficiency into your infrastructure, it's not just enough to virtualize. You need to automate so that you are automatically responding, adjusting your infrastructure based on workload, adjusting based on security policies, uh, managing and moving your workloads for things like disaster recovery or to better optimize your power. And the last piece of our vision when we talk about the open cloud, we talk about a cloud that is client aware. We talked about 15 billion connected devices by the year 2015, your refrigerator to your laptop to your car. What you will benefit, us as consumers and users of that cloud experience, we will benefit if those services are context aware and client aware so that depending on the size of screen, our battery life, our access to bandwidth, where we are, what we're interested in, all those kind of dynamics will let the cloud optimize to our device and we're gonna get a better user experience from it. So we've been talking about this vision for a while. Um, we're definitely seeing progress towards, and, and 2015 is just kind of a starting point where we were looking at in the future. But we're gonna see a lot of movement going forward. Um, this integration of hybrid clouds, your public and your private cloud. Um, my colleague, Das Kamhout, who runs Intel IT's cloud strategy is actually gonna be speaking here tomorrow. And he's gonna talk about how Intel IT built their cloud, starting first with an internal private cloud and now how they've evolved it to a private cloud. And you'll kinda of see long term where they're going into a much more adaptive, responsive environment. Um, of course, we have to make sure that not only our workloads are automated, but our security is automated, as well as this concept of, I mentioned, being much more predictive and adaptive to end user experience. So what I want to do now is talk about, let's go under the hood a little bit. If this is what the cloud is and the vision and it's great, it's got a lot of benefits and it's seamless and it's self-service and it's got all these things, I want to talk about, let's go under the hood and talk about some of the architectural changes and some of the trends that are shaping it so that we can deliver these capabilities to market. So Intel's cloud strategy, this has been pretty consistent for a couple years and may even have used this slide last year. We try to, one, listen to the industry, collaborate with the industry. You'll see a lot of open up here, right? It is a big trend, but it's important. We are a company that for the last 40 years, or over 40 years, four decades, we've learned that technology transitions are accelerated, are accelerated by standards. So we want to see the same thing happen for cloud. We want to see the same thing happen for big data. We want to see these infrastructures and solutions built out on open, interoperable standards so that we can accelerate the benefits of these chains. That's why we're involved with a number of these organizations like the Open Data Center Alliance, which I'll speak to more in a minute. We then funnel all that information in and we create optimized products and technologies. We've actually been developing products that have been specifically optimized for some of the world's largest data centers for a while 
but a lot of those technologies are applicable and useful for broad enterprise as well. And that's what we want to see happen. Where the technologies are good and useful, we want to see that kind of proliferation across the industry so that once again we're more rapidly accelerating the movement to the cloud and its benefits. And then the third piece of our strategy is really about making it easy to deploy. Whether you are building a cloud or whether you want to look and compare cloud services and bring that into your environment and integrate the two. We have tools, whether pretty simply named Cloud Builders, Cloud Finders, helps you build a cloud, helps you find a cloud. We'll talk about this at the end. But we want to create these tools that helps the industry, get, provides a common place of um, information across our broad partner ecosystem so that you can help choose your cloud deployment plans. So let's start first. I'm going to double click. Um, obviously, I don't need to go into OpenStack, um, but I do want to talk a little bit about the Open Data Center Alliance. This is the audience participation. Everybody, heads up. I'm going to ask you to raise your hand, OK? Um, first, how many of you in the past year or two have made a decision that involves bringing a cloud into your environment, building a cloud, any of the technologies around it, any decision with respect to bringing clouds into your business? Aha, good. <laughs> if you hadn't raised your hand, I wonder what you were doing here, but that's okay. Um, no, but um, out of you who raised your hand, how many of you would benefit from talking to your peers to learn how they've done it already and sharing those best practices in your environment? That's a common thing I hear from my customers when I'm out talking. One, I'm so surprised to hear how common their challenges are. They can be in completely different geographies. They can be completely different verticals, completely different business sizes. But a lot of the challenges they are facing are similar. And that's where the Open Data Center Alliance came together. It was really about being a unified voice of IT across enterprise IT and service provider IT. People who were building clouds, deploying cloud services, came together and said, I'd like to talk to my peers. I'd like to know that we're consolidating our voice, unifying our voice, collaborating, so that we're providing a common direction out to the industry about what type of solutions we need in our environment. And that's the vision of the Open Data Center Alliance. There's also some interesting, if you look about this group, so it's over 300 members globally that are members of the Open Data Center Alliance. Um, today, you'll see it's a pretty tech-savvy group. About 19% have over 40% of their operations in the cloud today in a private cloud environment. And about 6% are using public cloud services today. Watch what happens when we move to 2015. Nearly 60% of those surveyed will have over 40% or a material amount of their IT operations in the cloud, in a private cloud environment and 25% will have public cloud into their environment. This is actually faster. This, this survey of ODCA members is done year on year, and this is actually more accelerated. That's the type of people that are coming into the Open Data Center Alliance and collaborating, people who are really driving this trend. And uh, I know you won't be able to read this up here, but I'd really encourage you to go to the Open Data Center Alliance's website. It's an independent organization. Um, Intel is not on the board. There are 13 board companies. We are a technical advisor and administrator to the org. Um, so this is not something of Intel's, but it's something I personally believe in. Because this group of people come together and collaborate and actually create. And what they've created are three master usage models. Uh, one is compute infrastructure as a service. It's a guide of requirements on how to build compute infrastructure as a service in your environment. There's a corresponding master usage model around service orchestration. How then do you manage um, in that compute infrastructure as, as a service environment? And the third one is another key challenge I hear about a lot when talking to customers. And this is really about a commercial framework. Right now, when you go out and negotiate a public service into your environment, I'm hearing that one of the number one ROI killers of the cloud is the legal and, and, and negotiating that contract and negotiating your SLA. Um, what the Open Data Center Alliance is trying to do here is figure out, out of those commercial terms and framework, what part can be common or standard across 
so that we can more rapidly allow end users and service providers to focus on the parts of the service that are truly differentiated, right? And this is talking about that sticky differentiation, that part of the service that adds value, not the part of the service that is just standard T's and C's that we shouldn't be spending a lot of time on. So they're lengthy documents, and I know it's not all fun reading, but if you're interested and you want to learn from this group of individuals, I really recommend you go to the website. These were just launched last week. Um, they were done in partnership with some of the, um, about 28 of the largest hardware and software and services vendors, um, so that you really have that matching of the end user requirement and the solutions to help make these uh, open cloud solutions a reality. And I mentioned the board. This is just eight of the 13 board members. Um, but what's really important is that concept of walking your talk or eating your own dog food. If the Open Data Center Alliance is going to publish these usage models, they have to use them in their environment. Otherwise, if you know who's listening if you write all this stuff and then you don't actively deploy it in your environment. So the Open Data Center Alliance published these usage models, their requirements for cloud computing in their environment, and they're actually deploying against them. And you can see here, I don't need to walk you through a lot, all of them, but you can see here, these are companies that are putting ODCA requirements into their purchasing and RFPs. These are companies that are creating services around the ODCA requirements. I'll give you an example. Um, there's a security usage model that sets industry standard security levels, bronze, silver, gold, and platinum, and says we need commonality across these. We need to be able to compare against service providers, and we need to know what that means. So one of the examples was National Australia Bank, very large bank in Australia, um, said, hey, I want to test this out. I want to test out a gold or better service in my environment. Well, uh, Terramark is on the board. Uh, Terramark is owned by Verizon. It's their hosting firm. It's a, a large hosting company in the United States. Said, you know what? Let's do it. Let's create that handshake. We'll create a gold service in our, in our environment, and we'll test out this POC. And then what they do is they make those best practices available to members, and they share the proof of concept. So you wouldn't have to go through that. You wouldn't have to do the effort and build it out and procure the hardment and try it out. They've already done it for you, and you can go in and replicate it yourself. And that's what I mean by peer sharing and networking and how you can learn from some of your peers out in the industry. And this just highlights one more point from the survey. Um, as I mentioned, it really is important that these requirements are adopted. Two-thirds of our members say they're going to use them in purchasing and planning. There's a tool on the website. It's called the Performance Engine Assistant Tool and proposal engine assistant tool. Sorry, I'm, we'll talk performance in a minute. Um, but what this does, if you're interested, you don't have to be a member. If you're thinking about doing an RFP for cloud hardware, software, or services, you can go, click in, configure what you're doing, and it'll spit out some RFP language or, or common language that says, these are the things you should be looking for. So this is something anybody can do. Go to the website, and you can easily and quickly benefit from the work that the Alliance has done. So let's talk about product for a minute. Um, uh, as I mentioned, one of the things I've been lucky and fortunate to do is, is work with all different types of clouds. Um, the Open Data Center Alliance has been heavily focused on the private cloud, but also public cloud services, too. Um, I work with a number of service providers, whether it's the big guys or telcos moving into cloud services, hosting companies moving into cloud services. Um, it's really important that Intel creates technologies that meets the, deform the performance needed for on-demand self-service performance, is extremely efficient, and that's the automation as well as the power efficiency. We have to enable that elasticity and that scalability so that we're using, um, we're scaling wisely and pulling back when we don't need it but also security. Um, and security is not just the securing of the data, but it's also the privacy and the related issues on a ton of regulation and, and controls and IP protection. And um, when we look at these three vectors, we see them this day, I mean, it, uh, CPUs and performance used to just be about, sorry, CPUs used to be just about performance, right? When we talk about our CPUs and our product line now going forward, we know that everything has to be balanced across performance, efficiency, and security. And not just the basics, but the ability to do it in an automated, elastic way.
So when we look specifically at the cloud service providers, I wanna share some of the learnings. This is that kind of under the hood. Um, what have I learned from cloud service providers? One, it's gr they're growing fast. They're growing fast. A few years ago, the bulk of the market, you can see the blue up here, were the big four. And you can guess who the big four are. Um, that's really what the cloud infrastructure, the, the people who truly had an elastic scalable infrastructure or the, the cloud, right? It was controlled by the, the, the top four. Today though, the market's pretty much broken into thirds. The top four still are growing very fast, but the next 20, the challengers are rising up. It's not just, um, Jonathan mentioned some, it's, you, you know, it's still your rack space, but it's your Twitter and your Zynga and your Box and your, all these companies that are creating new services based on the capability of the infrastructure. Companies that didn't even exist prior to some of them four or five years ago. So these companies are growing, and what we're seeing is, although the top group, the large service providers, do a lot of their own design and engineering and really know kind of what they want, the rest of that market, the other two-thirds of the market, are really looking for, to have some of those same trends brought into their environment so that they can have not only the cost efficiency, but the service differentiation and the capability differentiation that maybe a larger player would. So let's talk about kind of four in, or three infrastructure changes and uh, platform trends that I'm seeing um, that are enabling some of the next generation platforms in the data center. Um, the first one I'm going to talk about is microserver, and some people call it extremely low power servers. So let's talk first about, so let me give you a definition of a microserver. It is shared infrastructure, you know, fewer power supplies, fewer cabling, less sheet metal, dense one socket servers that typically have what we call a WIMPy core, or let's call it a low power, lower performance core that enables higher density and efficiency for certain workloads. By the way, before anybody gets offended, WIMPy is not a pejorative term here. It's, it's a term of affection, because I'm going to talk to you about my favorite WIMPy core in just a minute. So please don't be offended by WIMPy. But I want to illustrate a point. There are brawny, beefy cores out there, high performance cores that have a lot of capability pack. This is your Xeon core. This is what most of the data center today, the vast majority of all data centers are run on. But you also have the emergence of these low power, wimpier cores. And what I want to talk about is what applications are better for what workloads? Or sorry, what processes are better for what workloads? And I've looked at four different workloads that are kind of commonly looked at when it comes to microservers of this extremely low power segment. Um, on your left is the brawny core, the higher performance, absolute raw performance, but also with performance efficiency. And on your right is this low power, lightweight, wimpier core. When you look at a hosting, there are places for both. If you want to build out your hosting infrastructure and manage your costs, one way to do it is through virtualization to better utilize your resources and to support your users in a virtualized environment. That's a lot of the area where the hosters are investing in these days. But there's also that segment of your business that wants a dedicated server. This is sometimes called physicalization versus virtualization, where you want to be able to provide a dedicated, hug your own little server to your environment and to whoever uses it. That's a great place for a low power core, and that's where we're seeing microservers emerge in the, mic in the hosting segment. Content delivery or content delivery networks is another area that we're seeing microservers looked at. Um, but once again, you can take content uh, CDNs and divide them into two categories. You have your simple CDN, where the data is pre-packaged, pre-formatted, um, your audio files, your media, your data files, and you need lower performance and high I.O., high throughput. But then again, there's also your content processing CDN, where you're gonna need to do real-time transcoding and encoding at the edge, the network edge, and you're gonna need some performance in your CDN if you're gonna be processing media files, video files, and passing it through. At that point, you're gonna benefit from scale and more performance to enable that processing. Another common workload that's commonly looked at right now for these low power, wimpier cores is analytics. Uh, we've done a lot of research in this. At any given time, um, you know, it's a balance between being CPU constrained, I.O. constrained, 
um, sorry, disconstrained or I.O. constrained, right? And that balance between the three will depend on your data set, the number of servers in your cluster, and the type of queries you're going to run. It may not be consistent for your environment. In these environments, we've done a lot of testing of our systems. If you need a more CPU intensive, more disk environment, the absolute performance for Hadoop analytics is going to come from your Xeon family. If you need more I.O. and you're going to run it faster, this is where you're going to see the lower power, lower power CPUs play. And the last one is memcached, distributed memory caching. Once again, there are multiple ways to architect in this environment. Some people prefer the scale, added memory, more disk of the Xeon. Others prefer to architect with smaller nodes, smaller lightweight nodes for a smaller blast radius, which means if a CPU fa or node fails, you have a smaller radius of impact, but you also have more servers to manage or more nodes to manage in that environment. So when you ask me what, which of these workloads is best for a low power core, unfortunately, the answer is it depends. But the thing I want to leave you with here is, really, one size doesn't fit all. So what you're going to benefit for these key emerging workloads, especially in analytics, you need the flexibility to scale between your low power WIMPy cores to your brawnier cores, depending on your architecture and environment. And this is my one roadmap foil. I couldn't give a presentation without having one roadmap foil. Um, but this is something that people, I don't think, know as well today. And this is kind of a perception battle, quite honestly, for me. Intel does have WIMPy cores. Um, we call them Atom. And Atom has been on our server roadmap. We have our first Atom for the server space. It's centered in, is the code name. It's on track to be in production by the end of the year. We demonstrated this platform earlier in the year running at sub 10 watt node. It's a six watt part. And that sits below our Xeon processors, which we've also taken and dropped the power and capabilities to hit sub, well, you can see 15 watts in last generation, 20 watts now, and that will continue with our next generation. So when I use the term wimpy, I'm talking about my, I'm not calling somebody else's baby ugly. I'm talking about my baby too, which is the Atom processor, which gives you that range of flexibility. And you'll see those systems. It'll be the industry's first 64-bit sub 10 watt node coming out this year. So another trend, I'm going to shift to convergence here for a minute. Um, this has been a big topic. I was just in China, and this was probably the number one topic among the large cloud service providers and the small over there. And it's really about this concept of the lines are blurring. What we think of as a server, network, and storage aren't just black and white physical boxes anymore. You have things like virtualized network environments where you're bringing into the server, right? You have more persistent storage in your server, where does the server and storage start to blend, right? So what we're seeing is there's twofold. One, if you want to have that maximum flexibility to have few converged platforms that can be programmably defined across a range of applications, right? There's your fl flexibility. Software programmability, <laughs> I can't speak. Software programmability um, across your applications but you also want to do it on industry standard building blocks because you want the cost effectiveness. So I'm going to give two examples. I'm going to talk first about the lines blurring between storage and compute, and then I'm going to talk about software-defined networking, another buzzword in the industry right now as we see the lines blurring between servers and, and networking. So what can we do with storage devices when we put performance and more capability in? Well. What we're seeing is a much more intelligent approach to architecting storage in the data center. First, you have to have a distributed storage architecture. Obviously, if we're going to handle all this unstructured data that's being created in the environment, we need, a, we need a distributed, scalable infrastructure to manage it. If you have performance, and in this case, I'm talking like a Xeon CPU that's been optimized for storage workloads and accelerations and key things like compression, right? You can put that intelligence in your distributed storage architecture with things like intelligent tiering, which simply means that you're going to, for those workloads in your data center that needs high performance hard drives or SSDs that are more costly, you're only going to put them where it's needed. 
And then you're going to use lower cost, lower performance hard drives and, and other storage technologies where it's not needed. Um, Intel IT saw an 80% reduction in hard drive costs by using this method. And it's that intelligence in the platform that enabled it. Um, you also need real-time compression. If you can automatically, real-time, on the Spark, compress your data, you can obviously store more and better utilize your devices, right? Just like we talk about compute and server utilization, we need to be looking at storage architecture and making sure that our storage infrastructure is fully utilized. And that's also where thin provisioning comes in. It's another way to kind of tame that data deluge, if you'd say, that says, look, I need the ability that where I have capacity and roaming, I need to be able to move it around. So my server shouldn't have to be under provisioned. I can, storage, I can over allocate to my storage environment and better utilize it. And you can save about 25% in your CapEx spend by better utilizing your storage infrastructure. So that was the convergence on the storage side. Now let's talk about software-defined networking. In today's traditional networks, you have a distributed, decoupled network of your routers and your switches, some physical, some virtual. What soft, and, it's, uh, and if you look at virtualization, it's very easy to spin up compute instances, much more difficult for the network administrator to respond and enable the I.O. capabilities behind it. What software-defined networking is really going to provide here is a mechanism for separating the control and management from the packet processing and the data movement. So you're going to have a centralized software-based controller in your network environment that's going to be able to network and connect with all your different switches and routers. When Intel got involved in this, of course, once again, we want to do it through industry standards. And here's another little thing I want to leave you about Intel. We are much more than a silicon company. We have significant investments in software, and we really try to look up the solution stack. And one of the examples is we have a software divine networking reference platform. This is a, um, it's called Seacliff Trail. What we've done is we've taken our silicon. You've got our Xeon and our Cave Creek chipset. We have our 10 gigabit ethernet on it. But what we've also done is incorporated Alta, which is from a company, it's Switch Silicon, from a company called Fulcrum, which we purchased a little while ago. What we've been able to do, now, Alta is really good switch, company, uh, switch silicon. It's why companies, some of the biggest in the business, have been purchasing fulcrum silicon for a while. It's got this stuff called asynchronous programming logic, which allows you to do really smart stuff in the router and the switch. But what it's done is it enabled us to couple the hardware we also purchased a number of years ago a company called WinRiver, which is an open source um, Linux operating system in this environment. We've built some APIs. We've partnered with other people for the APIs. And we've created the stack in the industry. So whether you need the APIs to write directly to the switch ha hardware, or the APIs to write at the control plane level, or management APIs to write networking services on top, you have a full stack of an open networking platform. Now, this may not be something that interests you today, but what, what I challenge you to do is look at your vendors out there, the people that you buy your networking components for. Um, a lot of them are making investments in this area. And as, we, as Jonathan said, right, make sure you're getting an open solution. And this is new. Some of these things are in testing this year, but you'll start seeing production systems uh, next year from a number of vendors. Uh, this is not something we sell, it's an enabling technology, so a number of vendors in the industry will be creating software-defined networking platforms and open networking platforms um, based on this. And this is something, like I said, when I, when I look at how do you get maximum flexibility by using industry standard silicon uh, on a converged set of silicon and having the APIs and the open source software on top of it, to have the flexibility to truly configure your networking appliances, this is a great cost-saving measure, measure and, uh, and a differentiator in the industry. And the third trend is big data. Can't have a cloud conversation without big data day. Um, oh, look, the D's dropped. Um, that was a mistake. Um, but when we talk about big data, we gave you a clip in the beginning. We got to look at where this data is coming from. This is really interesting. So we all have business generated data. We all have our traditional BI systems and, and way to manage that in our environment. Then we have all this consumer driven data, our human driven data. Every time we create pictures and every time we um, all these uh, you know all the things that we track and upload and videos, etc. 
And the last piece um, is machine-generated data. Out of those 15 billion connected devices in the world, did you know about 12 billion will come from machine-to-machine -machine type data? So that's a considerable portion coming. I was watching another little thing about the sensors in cows around the world and how they generate millions and millions and billions of bytes of data from cows, right? This is what I'm talking about. But more importantly probably to you is if you walk into a smart city and there are sensors and data that are watching you and looking for suspicious behavior so that you are more protected and they can be, you can be alerted. Or um, sensors that are looking for uh, weather related or, or natural disasters. Or if you are a farmer and you're building a smart farm that's using sensors to help you with weather patterns and, and better maximize your agricultural investments. This is the kind of machine generated data that really makes big data exciting. And next time you go to the mall and you walk up to a smart sign, you know, that sign may be saying, wow, she looked at that watch for 30 seconds and it makes a mental note. Um, woman, age undefined, woman looks at watch, 30 second, passes it back to the retailer. It's, it's, um, it's uh, you, you know, it's not, uh, what's the word? It's not exposing you personally, but it's passing that smart data back. Um, and that's this kind of data that we're creating. So the question is, what are we going to do about it? Um, this is much more than a hardware play. This is software and the way you manage above it. There's a couple different things emerging to handle it. One is distributed file systems like Hadoop, which enable you to access your data over multiple clusters of surveys and, uh, servers and query from it. We're also seeing the rise of, with our, some of our bigger um, processors like our E5 and 7, more in-memory analytics when you have more memory available to your system. Um, when we look at creating the platform here, it is a balance of compute. It's a balance of your network bandwidth. Do you have the frequency and, and I.O. capabilities to handle it? Do you have the compute to process it? Do you have that distributed storage behind it to accurately or to, to store all that data being generated? but then do you have the tools? Um, so we've been doing a lot of work to create reference architectures and, and optimizations in this area, so that if you're interested, once again, you can come and kind of learn about what we've been doing in the big data space and how you can architect these solutions and get more insight. You know, it was Gartner that I was reading a report said that by the year 2015, a company that's used da big data analytics in their environment will be 20% more competitive than somebody who doesn't. Can you imagine, in this economy, if you have access to something that's going to make you 20% more competitive, whether you're a small business or a large, this is a definitely an emerging trend, not just for the fact that we have to do something with all that data, but we're going to turn it around into something useful. Oh, wait. One other thing. I can't see it. You can't. Uh, we've got to work on the foil size here, but there's a really cool link. If you're like me, I like fun facts. I love those little statistics about how many billions of zettabytes of data can a cow create. If you go to um, check out uh, Big Data Dashboard at intel.com, it's an interactive to tool. You can enter in some things about your life, and it can show you how much data you're personally creating or you're creating kind of in your sphere of influence. It's, it's just kind of a fun, fun way to get your head around big data. So the last piece I mentioned is about making this more easily deployable and easily uh, consumable by you. And we have two tools. The first is I'm going to talk about Cloud Finder. This is new. We just launched it in September. This is about helping companies choose the right cloud service for their environment. Um, these initial companies that you see listed, these were just our pilot companies. We did it very small just to test it out. But what you do is these cloud service providers have come in and filled out their capabilities, their services, their whatever standards they're compliant with, all the things about their service. And they've gone through about a battery of testing of nearly 100 questions that cover security, what type of physical and soft security measures do they have, what are they doing in terms of regulation and privacy, usability, quality, what are their SLAs, what are they doing in terms of backups and recovery and disaster recovery, availability, the types of technologies they're doing, compliance to key standards, and some of the business metrics about how they price, how they architect their service, and how you can use it. 
choosing a cloud is very difficult because there's no standard. There's no standard common service catalog that enables us to look at each cloud service provider as apples to apples and apples. What this tool does is give you a common format so that you can go in and pick the things that you care about or that you're interested in learning about and it will give you a customized report and show you how service providers stack up. We've had amazing uh, response from the service providers. They like this tool because it's a good education tool. And even if you don't know what to ask for, you don't know what you'd want in the cloud service, there are these great links and you can kind of click in and you can see knowing that some really smart people in the industry, not just at Intel, we partnered with a number of people to create these questions, what they think are important and why. And then we have the Cloud Builder Program. This program's been around for two years now. These are the reference architectures I've been talking about. These are not, not marketing collaterals. These are, in some cases, 80-page documents down to the script level, how to build a cloud. So there are over 50 industry leaders in this partner. Pretty much everybody, any major OEM or ISV or layer the stack, they've all come together, helped create, they are built, they are tested at scale, and then they are documented. And so you can go in, whether you're gonna build a cloud, you have a blueprint for how to build your own, or you can just get BKMs based on what other people have done and tested. Um, there are over 100 reference architectures available. You can go in and sort and choose by what matters to you if you wanna understand something about security or efficiency or automation. Um, you can go through or search by your favorite vendor, your partner of choice. Um, you'll find a lot of um, opportunities for learning within, um, as well as to help speed up your deployment to market. So I hope you saw a little bit under the hood today what the service providers and what we hope enterprise will be doing to make your IT infrastructure more efficient and able to scale and that elasticity needed to manage the type of data and then to build that robust platform that will enable you to do the anal analytics and gain that insight from your data. We do, as I said, I fundamentally believe in the word open, if open means interoperable, um, standards base, right? This is about accelerating technology tr transitions, providing cost efficiencies and flexibility in your infrastructure that really enable that sticky differentiation, right, to stand out because it's on a common building block. Um, Intel, I hope you saw a little bit about us. We really are more than a chip company. We care about storage, network, and compute, security, orchestration, all across the data center. Um, we really do want to provide the best technologies that help to people today and tomorrow build out their cloud infrastructures. And we want to help you too. So if you have any questions for me, please go to our online resources. You can go to CloudFinder, intelcloudfinders.com, cloudbuilders.com, or I've put my Twitter handle, reach out to me. Um, I'd be happy to answer your questions, and if I can't, if you want to know something that I don't know, I know a lot of people back in Intel I can connect you to, and I'll get you sorted out in the right, right place. So I have two minutes again before I'm done, but I'm going to end early, but I'm going to do one more thing. This is something, I see a number of women out here, and uh, I wanted to get a chance to promote this org. This is something I became a member of about a year ago. It's called the Cloud Network of Women. Um, it's great to see a lot of women here, and there are a lot of women who care about technology and want to network with others, um, both professionally and personally. So the Cloud Network of Women is an organization. It's a nonprofit. We've got uh, uh, the founders here, Jocelyn DeGrantz. Um, it's sponsored by a number of the big companies, but if you're interested, um, definitely connect with a number of us, not just myself, but there's a number of uh, CloudNow women in the room. This is a great place you can uh, learn more about women in technology. So with that, I am done. Thank you for your time, and I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Regine Skillen, a great plug for CloudNow. You know, Cloud Expo is a great supporter of that, so yes, let's have more.